in your Bible to the book of Matthew. So I, uh, know, I hear, but also know for a fact that you all finished the book of Deuteronomy last week. I know because I saw the video. I heard Aaron preach the final sermon. Thank you, Aaron. And uh, today we're starting something new. I'm really excited about it. Uh, it's going to be uh, something uh, I've never done before, and that is uh, to preach a series of sermons on a very small passage. So after getting through Revelation, which was like a marathon, and then going to Deuteronomy, which was like running two marathons, uh, not just in the time spent, but just the, 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 the depth of it, uh, those two books, rich and complicated. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time, or a portion of time, on four verses, so probably seven or eight sermons on the Lord's Prayer. So Matthew chapter 6, today uh, will be our first of these series of sermons. And uh, I want to set the context a little bit. Matthew chapter 6, if you, if you see that there, uh, if you have a, if you have a, a, a Bible that uses, puts Jesus' words in red, you'll say it's nicely embedded in a lot of red. Because this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is a sermon that Jesus gave at the beginning of his ministry to his disciples. He was training his followers, right? He was going to, he just had performed some miracles. He had been speaking, and so people were amazed, and they begin to gather. They begin to follow him um, and, and wonder, what's up with this guy? We want to see what he's doing. We want to hear what he has to say that uh, sounds so familiar to the Old Testament, but also very radically different. So they were following him. And it says that he saw the crowds, this is chapter 5, verse 1, and he went up on a mountain. So he sees all the crowds of people, and he goes up on top of a mountain, and his disciples come to him. So these 12 men, they come gather around him, and he's going to speak to them. He opens his mouth, and he gives the Sermon on the Mount, is what we call it. And it's a training session before he begins to demonstrate to them what it looks like to care for these people, uh, to shepherd them, to lead them, to enter into their lives and the complications and the frustrations and the joys of being with his mess of a people, he is going to speak to them. He's going to lecture them on what that looks like, who they are, how to love well, how not to speak in anger. Or seek revenge. I, uh, we went and saw Levi and Isaiah. A part of our trip was going to visit Levi and Isaiah. Levi in Atlanta at Georgia Tech. Isaiah at Covenant College in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And when we see them, we will, Alice and I will often think, have we adequately trained them for adulthood? Have we forgotten something? And, and we think, I think of things, I think, I think I, I don't think I've trained them on how to change a car tire or how to be a boyfriend or a husband or a father. Have we trained them on how to get a job, to, to wear a tie, even though it may feel silly, to wear a tie when you go for a job interview, to ask questions when you're with somebody and not just talk, 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 or what about the finer points of Calvinism and the differences between superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism? Things, you know, that we all know about and cherish deeply. But one thing that we say to them, because we know we have not adequately trained them, is any time that you're in a tough spot, Anytime you're confused, anytime you're uncertain, call us. Call us. Reach out to us. We, are, we, we, will, we will pick up the phone. We will answer it. We want to hear from you. We're still your mom. We're still your dad. We still love you and have things to contribute to your life. Well, in a similar way, in the very middle of this lecture, in this sermon, this preparation from Jesus to his disciples and to us as well as his followers, as his disciples. 
He basically says, call any time. Talk to your father. Talk to him. He's listening. And he responds. And your prayers, your words to him, not only does he hear, but he responds and they are powerful and they are effective, those words. Call anytime. So listen to this. So I'm going to verse, I'm going to start in verse 5. A little backing up from the Lord's Prayer. Put it in context. Verse 5, chapter 6 of Matthew. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. And pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Now, before we read this, and what I want to do is I want us to read this together, to read the Lord's Prayer, but just note That before he gives the Lord's Prayer, he commands them, he exhorts them not to pray like those who are praying for the pleasure or for the glory of others. So when you pray, consider first your own heart, your own posture to God. Consider that you are are praying for God's glory. You are praying not... Because of what you think your neighbor might think. Or that you're worried about what your friends or your family may think. Or to impress anybody else. Or that by adding wonderful, great words or more words, that somehow that gains you greater honor in God's eyes or others. But you are talking to God. He is the object of your words. And then he tells them how to pray. And I want to invite you all to add your voice to mine. Let's say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for these words that you gave us through your son, Jesus. You you didn't just leave it out there for us to figure out how to to speak to you, but you taught us. Continue to teach us. Teach us to not be consumed by what others think or to live believing that somehow it is our righteousness that makes us worthy to come before your throne and to gain your ear, but rather it is what Jesus has done for us. Give us greater love for your word, for these words in particular. In your name we pray, amen. So two words I want us to focus on today. The first two words of the prayer. Our Father. Those are the only two things we're going to talk about today. That's why it's going to be at least seven, maybe more sermons. And I want to talk a little bit first about the word our, right? The word our. And I want to introduce it by asking a question. A question that honestly I'd never thought about until preparing for this sermon. And the question is, and I want you to consider how you would answer this question. Did Jesus himself pray the Lord's Prayer? Initially my thought was, yes. I mean, just of course, it's the Lord's Prayer. Just like... You know, we have Josh's cookies, 
And of course, they're Josh's cookies, so Josh would partake in his own cookies, right? And it's the Lord's Prayer, so of course the Lord prays his prayer. And so I love, with that in mind, I love that the first word, our, communicates to us that we have solidarity with Jesus. That we are one with Christ. And that is something that we see all the way through the Old Testament. We see that Jesus came into this world to be like us. It's what Philippians 2 tells us when it says that he emptied himself, becoming nothing, becoming like a servant. In other words, becoming like us. He became like us. He became part of his people. And in John chapter 15, we know that Jesus talked about the vine and the branches. And he says, he is the vine. We are the branches. We are connected in that language of being in Christ. If you've been in the church for any amount of time, you have probably heard or read in scripture the, word, the, the language of being in Christ. That's emphasizing that when you follow Jesus, you become one with him. He is the body. or We are the body and he is the what? Head. We're connected. We are in him and he is in us. We have union with him. And so I love that the word our communicates. The very first word communicates seems to. It communicates that oneness that we have with Jesus. However, I think right now I would have to answer the question, did Jesus pray the Lord's Prayer? I would have to say no, or at least probably not. And the reason is because later, as you read, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive others. So surely Jesus wouldn't have prayed that because he wasn't in need of forgiveness from the Father. Right? He didn't commit sins. He was sinless. But the Greek word there is actually, as it says, is debt. It's not the word that is commonly used for sin. It's indebtedness. But oftentimes those things can mean the same thing. So we'll have to wait for the answer until I get to that part of the sermon to find out whether we would know Jesus prayed this prayer. But for now, I would say probably not. But I would also, again, say that this sermon, this, this prayer, demonstrates the oneness that Jesus has with his people. And that is all throughout Scripture. But what it clearly communicates to us, that first word, our, it communicates that God intended that we would be united together. That the people of God, those who are followers of Jesus, there is a oneness, an ourness that is something that is inescapable. And that is something that is, I think for many of us, we would like to escape. When we have seen the mess of the church, especially over the last two and three years, in, in the political environment that we've lived in, there are many who have said, you know, I don't want to identify as a Christian, I don't want to identify as, and they will use the word evangelical, and I get that. But what we cannot escape if we are a follower of Jesus, regardless of race or color or political persuasion, is that we are connected to one another and we cannot escape that. We might be uncomfortable with some of the language, we might be uncomfortable with some of the positions or personalities of those within the body, but just like a family, we can run to the farthest places of the earth to escape. We cannot escape that we are connected to one another. Prayer highlights. And we see that here in the first word. Prayer highlights, emphasizes that we belong to each other. I belong to you. You belong to me. It's what has been coined in a term throughout church history as the communion of the saints. It's not talking about communion that we have here, although that's a representative of it, but it's talking about the community-ness, the oneness that we have with each other. <laughs> Many years ago, uh, in the mid-1600s, uh, there was a lot of fractureness in the church, not just Catholic and Protestant, 
but even within Protestantism and within Catholicism, there was a lot of brokenness, and, and they, were, they were actually hunting one another down, killing one another, fighting. And so the church in England said, we've got we've to we've understand here what we share in common. And so they got some of the leaders of the church at that time together that were, that were respected and known church leaders. And they said they put them all in a room essentially for a few years and said, can you just read scripture and summarize for us what it is that we believe or should believe? It's called the Westminster Divines. And they worked and they, they, they got into the Greek and they got into the Hebrew and they, they read it and they prayed and prayed and prayed and talked and wrote and crossed out and, and argued. And what they came up with was a large document that is still used today called the Westminster Confession of Faith. And in chapter 25, they actually address the communion of the saints and listen to the language of the, that they wrote to describe the word our in the Lord's Prayer, the communityness. It goes like this. The universal church, which is invisible, in other words, we don't know, we don't have the eyes, only God has the eyes to know who are the true believers. The universal church, which is invisible, consists of the whole number of the elect that have been, in other words, those of the past, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Peter, Paul, Mary, Luke, John, who are us today, and those who shall be gathered into one under Christ, the head thereof, and is the spouse, the body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. That is a wonderful summary of what it means to be part of the communion of the saints. That is what it means when we pray the Lord's Prayer. That when we say the word hour or when we are meeting together to pray at community groups or in the back room or Wednesday mornings in the basement of uh, the Havens home, when we gather and we're praying for one another, we need to begin with the mindset that we are intimately connected to number each other. This is not about me personally, although private or personal prayers are absolutely fine and good and encouraged in Scripture. But the emphasis here is that when we pray, we are praying not privately, but personally in the context of all God's people. We belong. You are not alone. And to try to believe or act as if your relationship with Jesus is yours privately and nobody else has anything to say about that is wrong we are meant to be together prayer here highlights that it is meant for the building up of the body of christ prayer breaks down walls walls that the world is building up the church should be the example of communityness that transcends race and color and class and personality and gender it brings together people from all walks of life and Jesus says we are one and to communicate anything differently is counter to the prayer that he gave to us and we're forgetful of that oftentimes when we pray primarily for our own personal needs. Is, there is absolutely a place for that. But I think we could stand for the conviction, stand convicted of praying more often for ourselves rather than praying for those and with those around the world and in our own community. We pray every Wednesday morning in the Haven's basement at 7 a.m. Please join us, even if you could come every once in a while. We pray for you all regularly, alphabetically, through the whole list of people that come to our church. We pray for the needs of those in our church and in our world. And every once in a while, one of the Haven's seven plus children will meander down into our presence and climb up on their daddy's lap 
and we don't say, hey, this is, a, this is a, our prayer time. This is adult prayer time. Um, so, you know, why don't you go back upstairs, watch TV, play your piano, do your math, homework. No. We say, you're welcome. How can we pray for you? What would you like for us to pray for? And one time I remember, I'm pretty sure it was Evie. I'm not sure, but pretty sure it was her. She was down there. She was little. And we said, what can we pray for you about, Evie? And she said, and she thought a minute, Scott Brinkerhoff. She didn't, she didn't want to pray for a new toy or a boo-boo or breakfast. Scott Brinkerhoff. You, you mean who lives on the other side of the planet? Who you've met like once? The missionary in South Sudan? Yeah. We'll pray for Scott Brinkerhoff. And we did. And we still do. And our prayers because of Evie were effective in a tiny village with a small school in South Sudan. That's how we should pray. The second word <clears throat> is a hard word. It's a word that for many of us will, many people in our world, um, bring hard emotions. Fear, maybe, anger, resentment, guilt, shame. The word in many other languages, that every language has it, daddy, pop, pai, vater, tito, father. It's a beautiful word, but it is also a word that stirs oftentimes hard memories because we have had imperfect fathers. We have had fathers who have not been present. We have fathers who have been hurtful. And we are fathers who have been imperfect and have done damage. And I found myself wondering, why did Jesus choose to use that word when he knew, he knew the failure of fathers? He knew the fathers who had done damage. It was the same then as it is now. Couldn't he have used a different word? Didn't he know that that word was going to trigger hard emotions right in the middle of his prayer or right at the beginning, I'm sorry, of his prayer? But he didn't. He wanted us to use that word. He wanted us to consider with our wrestling with fatherhood as failed fathers and those who have suffered under harsh fathers. He wanted us to know that in our prayer, we have a father who is good and who exists and is for us. He wanted us to consider our relationship with his father, who is our father too. And two qualities that, he, that I want to highlight, there are many things you could say about the idea of God as father, God the father, but two I want to highlight from scripture. One is intimacy. The other is authority, but first intimacy. That the relationship that he wants us to consider when we talk to God is that God loves us. We are in relationship to Him. And it's a relationship that supersedes, runs deeper than the relationship that we have with our earthly father. Whether he was wonderful or horrible, or somewhere in between. The relationship that we have with that person up there who created all things with the words of his mouth and sustains all things. We have a relationship with him that is intimate that is defined by love and mercy and grace and the language that is used, the very words from Ephesians chapter 1. 
is to be imitators of God as beloved children. He loves us. He is our pro provider. He is our protector. And we, we heard this in Deuteronomy several times, the language that he used to describe wayward, forgetful, unruly, sinful Israel was treasured possession. If you are in Christ, if you're part of the hour of the communion of the saints, then the language that God has for you is, you are my beloved child, you are my son, you are my daughter. John 3.16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son. He was a father who was willing to give up the one son who was without sin in order to be the father of us all. But how do we, how do we, how do we enter into that? How do we become that, right? How do we enter into that? Like, with a child, it's giving birth. We were watching a show about a farm, and yet last night, Alice and I watched a couple scenes of cows being born, and they spared us no expense of how that happens. And it was painful just to watch. And the cow, the calf came out and it was in all its glory and all its beauty. And that's how the cow became a son or a daughter. How do we become born into the relationship of father and child? Well, John 1.12 puts it this way. All who receive Jesus are given the right to be called the children of God. It's not through being born into a particular faith. It's not through being having the perfect Calvinistic theology and knowing the difference between infra and superlapsarianism. It's not by being good. It's by receiving Jesus. It's by acknowledging that I am a sinner and I need help. And Jesus died taking my sins on that cross. And in that, I have become a child of the living God. The Father who knows us and created us after His own image. That's the intimate relationship that we have with Father. But second, or I should say, and second, along with that, Father gives the idea, it communicates the idea that is all throughout Scripture that we understand as being authority. The word for Father is used to give honor, respect, and submission to a person, whether it was a blood relative father, but it could refer to a teacher or a, um, a religious leader like a rabbi or a, a leader politically in the community. It communicates authority. It communicates that we need you and you have to, something to give to us which is to guide us or to give wisdom or direction or encouragement or exhortation. Our position is that of listening and receiving. And we acknowledge you as the one who gives, who guides, who protects, who, who provides. And we hear that even in the language of Jesus. Not only here when he says our Father, but at the end of his life before he was to go to the cross you know Jesus was in the garden and he was praying just and he knew he knew all along what, what was going to happen or the direction that he was moving in to die for us he knew and he's in the garden very close to that time and he prays a prayer to Jesus in chapter 26 he says my father if it is possible let this cup pass from me. In other words, Lord, if it is possible, can I get out of this situation? But then he says, not my will be done, but yours. What was he communicating there? The authority of the Father. Even Jesus, who was perfect and who is one with God the Father, understood the position of the Father as that of authority. 
And, and that's, that's hard for us because, man, we, we, we're Americans. We don't like authority, you know, unless it serves us. We're going to wrestle against it. We have a say in what happens here. And if we don't, we're angry. And I get it. And I'm thankful for our politics, by and large, most of the time, some of the time. But it's hard for us then to understand that our relationship to the Father is that, that he is sovereign completely. We don't have a say in the matter of how things run. It's God's world. He created it. He determines how things operate. And yet he's good and merciful. And somehow, in some strange way, even our prayers are powerful and effective. He uses those things not to, not as a, or he uses our prayers not as a way that contradicts or changes his will, but in a way that weaves itself into his will. Our Father communicates to ourselves, to one another, that we are one. And that we have a God who loves us, and we are his children. But we also submit to him in a world that is a mess. And we contribute to that mess. When I was uh, coming out of college, trying to be an adult, I was adulting for the first time, which involved making money <laughs> and not just spending it. I got a job at a publishing company in North Carolina, and uh, the boss there was a wonderful man. He was a good leader, faithful he was a godly man. He was energetic, never without interesting ideas and creativity. But he also uh, was merciful and kind. But there was also a sense of fear for those that worked under him. Because we knew that he could fire somebody at any point. And we saw him fire people. Or he could give a raise, or give an exhortation, or move somebody to a new position. So you can imagine what it felt like for me when one day I went to him in his office and said, I would like to date your daughter, if you're okay with that. I had asked Alice about it beforehand. And she was okay with it, but she said, you might want to talk to my dad, who was my boss. And he said, I really want to say no. But it's not about you. I have five daughters, and with every single one of them, I want to protect them from anything out there that may cause pain. So, so I'm, I'm not, not going to say no. I'm just going to say, proceed with caution, <laughs> thoughtfully and prayerfully. I will. Fathers protect. Fathers lead. Fathers love. And our Father in heaven is the only one who does that perfectly. And he is for us. We went and visited Alice's parents this past week. And her father is, his body is consumed now with Parkinson's and with cancer. And we know, and he knows, he, we spent time together talking about heaven. And we know that his days on this planet as Alice's father are numbered. Because soon he will go and he will be with our Father. Where we will be too for those who follow him. And that's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for her family and it's going to be hard for me too. Because I've grown to love him as a father. But what we know is this, brothers and sisters. The good news for us is this. Is that we have a father who is in heaven, who is eternal. 
is eternally good, infinitely good, infinitely merciful, infinitely just, and infinitely loving. We have a Father who never will grow old, who will never leave us or forsake us. He is for us, and He invites us to come into His presence and to say to Him, Father, forgive us. Father, guide us. Father, be with us. And so pray. Midtown Church, I invite you from the two first two words of this prayer to make time to pray. Pray because God has joined us together as a body with Jesus as our head. And he is listening and he is acting upon those prayers. Do this more. Do this often. He is a faithful father. Let me pray. Father, in heaven, thank you that you love us. Thank you that we are your children. Thank you that you did not spare your own son, but gave him as a sacrifice for our sins. And now, at this very moment, is with you in heaven, seated beside you, interceding on, to you on our behalf. We thank you for this. Help us to believe it, to trust it to have confidence in this. Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Invite you now, brothers and sisters, let's stand and gather in a circle around the chairs uh, as we receive the Lord's Supper and sing our final song. On the night that Jesus was betrayed by his own, uh, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body. As often as you eat this, do this.